How do you turn this on? Oh, is this on? Oh, look at that. Hi, everyone. Just take a seat. We're going to begin. Um, thank you all for coming. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you. The UN Foundation and the University College of London are pleased to have you here today to explore the meaning of a just and equitable transition for the maritime sector. Some may ask, why are we talking about shipping at COP? However, it's important to note that if shipping were a country, it would be the eighth largest emitter by emissions. Therefore, you cannot talk about reducing emissions without talking about shipping. The sector will also play a pivotal role in the demand for green fuels and the green energy transition. Right now, the IMO is actively negotiating whether to place a global pricing mechanism on, on emissions, the first of its kind, which could unlock billions of dollars of financing to transition the sector, as well as to address the mitigation and adaptation needs in developing countries. Forging a path to a green future for shipping, for the shipping sector, where no country, no community, no seafarer is left behind, demands global collaboration and targeted partnerships between the public and private sectors. It also requires a holistic approach that pro uh, prioritizes both environmental sustainability and people, ensuring that the sector remains on a 1.5 aligned trajectory while addressing the socioeconomic impacts of the transition on some of the most vulnerable groups of countries. Today's presentation and panel comes after the International Maritime Organization adopted its revised strategy for the reduction of GHG emissions in shipping this July. The new strategy lays the groundwork for the trajectory towards net, net zero emissions in international shipping by 2050, with interim targets for 2030 and 2040 while placing an explicit focus on leveling the playing field and supporting a just and equitable transition. I think the revision of the strategy shows decarbonization of the shipping sector is within reach, and we should no longer say that shipping is a hard to abate sector. I must emphasize the importance of a group of small island Pacific states led by our keynote speaker, Ambassador Albany Shoda of the Republic of the Marshall Islands in pursuing ambitious targets in the revision and ensuring that an emphasis on a just and equitable transition remain pivotal to the strategy, especially as the IMO goes into phase two of the negotiations on binding regulations on a fuel standard and a pricing mechanism on emissions. So following the address from Ambassador Shoda, Dr. Simon Chinyi of University College of London will delve into the components of a just and equitable transition tailored for the maritime sector and why this issue is quite complex. Our panel, moderated by Dr. Jean-Yves Remy and made up of representatives from both the public and private sector, will explore opportunities to overcome challenges in transitioning the sector and what is important in ensuring the the transition addresses the needs of countries, companies, and people. Decarbonizing the maritime sector is important for us to keep 1.5 in reach, and I'm pleased to have this conversation here at COP28. Through these discussions and dialogues, we hope to pave a way for the maritime industry that leads the charge towards a greener, fairer world. Thank you, and with that, I would like to turn it over to Ambassador Ishoda, Special Envoy for the Decarbonization of Maritime Shipping for the Republic of the Marshall Islands. Thank you. Good. It's a manageable audience. <laughs> I was a bit nervous coming here. But uh, thank you, Caroline, for that um, for that eulogy. <laughs> thank you for the introduction. Um, I was in a uh, I was speaking last night too in an event, and someone rightly said that shipping touches each and every one of us. 
whether you're a seaman or a consumer or all along the supply chain, shipping has an impact on our lives. Uh, now, I come from the Marshall Islands, one of uh, only four coral atolls in the world, completely made up of coral atolls with an approximate elevation about three meters above sea level. So you can understand why shipping is such an important subject for the people and the government of the Marshall Islands. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, today I stand before you to share the ambitious vision of the Republic of the Marshall Islands, an island nation that has long been at the forefront of global fight against climate change. Our ambition is clear to achieve the 1.5 degrees Celsius agenda, and in doing so, protect our fragile env environment, our culture, and our very way of life. The Marshall Islands is acutely aware of the existential threat that climate change poses to our existence. Rising sea levels, more intense storms, and changing weather patterns are not abstract concepts for us. They are our daily reality. We have witnessed the encroachment of the ocean on our shores and we have felt the devastating impact of climate-related disasters. We are a small island developing state, and we have no choice but to be at the forefront of this battle. Our commitment to 1.5 Celsius target is unwavering. We understand that limiting global warming to this level is not just a matter of policy, it is a matter of survival. To achieve this goal, we have put forward bold initiatives. The universal mandatory GHG levy for international shipping. This levy is our contribution to the global effort to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and transition to a more sustainable future. Yet, setting our emissions reduction ambition alone is not enough. We must undertake this transition in a profoundly unequal world. We must therefore also be ambitious in our commitment to equity and to ensuring that the profound transformations we are undertaking reverses and not entrenches the current gaps between the developed and developing world. What sets our approach apart is our unwavering commitment to an equitable transition. We understand that the burden of addressing the climate change should not fall disproportionately on those who have contributed the least to the problem. Our levy is designated to be or our levy is designed to be equitable, ensuring that the responsibility for addressing climate change is shared by all with the heaviest burdens carried by those who can most afford it. We are advocating for an equitable transition that leaves no one behind. What that means is one, the transition should be procedurally fair. Developing countries, and particularly SIDS and LDCs, need to be at the table when these decisions are made. Two, the transition should be equitable in terms of maritime mitigation. The research, development, and deployment of fuels, technologies, and infrastructure for zero emission shipping on a well-to-wake basis should allow all states to access, to access to strategic and sustainable development opportunities in the new energy and fuels market created by this transition. Third, the transition should be equitable 
in terms of responding to climate impacts. Shipping emissions of cost are causing and will continue to cause climate impacts. The polluter pays principle therefore requires that the majority of the revenues generated from pricing greenhouse gas emissions should be directed to addressing those impact, climate impacts in developing countries, in particular SIDS and LDCs. Equity, in our view, is not just a matter of economic fairness. It is a matter of justice. It means leaving no one behind. It means recognizing the most vulnerable among us, those in the marginalized communities, those on the front lines of climate impacts must be supported and protected as we embark on this global journey towards sustainability. We will use the revenue generated from this levy to invest in clean energy solutions to strengthen our resilience against climate impacts and to support those in our society who need it the most. We will ensure that our transition to a low carbon economy creates jobs, empowers our people, and enhances our overall well-being. We must acknowledge the unique situation in each of our countries. Some of us are perfectly situated for low-cost green hydrogen production, but we face the threat of more affluent nations leveraging their economic strength to dominate the global markets. Economic development is, a vital, is vital for some of us as it sustains a functional global trade system. While for others, it is the linchpin for maintaining a basic standard of living. Additionally, some of us heavily rely on shipping for essential tourism, income, and opportunities. We need all of this to happen with urgency. For the levy to be effective, it needs to have an ambitious entry price. Too low, and we send the wrong signals. One that enables only a partial transition to intermediate fuels. When we proposed this levy at MEPC 76, we called for an entry price of $100 per ton of CO2 emissions. It, and we had expected that to be operationalized by 2025. Unfortunately, now that the IMO has determined not to act before 2027, the price must increase if we are to achieve the necessary ambition, which is why I am announcing our intention to now call for an entry price of $150 a ton of CO2 emission at MEPC 81. It is time to stop the ambiguity around defining these measures. It is time to take determined actions. In this endeavor, we call on all the international community to stand with us. We ask for your partnership, your support, and your commitment to a more sustainable and equitable future. Our challenge is global, and it requires global response. Together, we can achieve the 1.5 degrees Celsius agenda. And together, we can protect our planet for future generations. Together, we can ensure that no one is left behind. Our vision is ambitious, but our determination is unwavering. It is life. It is security for us. The Republic of the Marshall Islands is ready to lead the way and we invite you to join us on this historic journey toward a brighter and more sustainable future. I thank you for your attention. Como tada. Thank you for that warm and heartfelt speech, um, Ambassador Shoda. Um, and with that, I want to turn it over to Dr. Simon Chinyi to talk about the details on just an equitable transition. 
So thank you very much. That was great, Ambassador Shoda. That, that's the way to start this, that you really brought it actually home to what exactly matters and why I, am, I really, really enjoy, is not the right word, but working with island states themselves. And that is because what is happening here at Just Transition is not just about it, the economy and moving things forward. It's about cultural identity. It's about, it's about who you are. And I think you drove that home really well so much so that I barely need to give a presentation now because you covered up so much of what I'm about to cover. So, but anyway, thank you very much. I think that was an, an excellent set, an excellent tone in this lovely room that we're here in today. But anyway, I, thank you all for coming. This is very timely. Uh, there needs to be this just and equ equitable transition that we know in all industries, but this is a real opportunity here in the shipping industry to move things forward perhaps faster and, uh, and putting in energies that are more equitable. So my presentation today is an overview of where we are in the just transition of this in industry. And spoiler alert, we are right at the beginning. But I very much look forward to discussing this with you and the panel uh, as we move forward. So, as Curleen mentioned earlier, in July of this year at the IMO, it adopted its revised greenhouse gas strategy at the MEPC 80. While not quite in line with the 1.5 degrees set out in Paris, it did represent a major leap forward in ambition. It has brought the sector's required transition from fossil fuels to scalable, sustainable, renewable fuels into the decades of the, of the, of the 2030s. Even at the lowest ambition of interpretation of the strategy, the average uh, ship's greenhouse gas intensity will need to be reduced by 80% by 2040. This means that uh, this means that rational, regional, corporate actions need to move to clearer 1.5 alignment, otherwise they will lag behind the, MI, uh, the IMO's ambition. However, while it remains crucial in, fa in factoring new targets, especially those for targets for 2030 and 2040, as well as the decarbonization of all levels of transition, it was also made very clear that this needs to be done in a just and equitable way that leaves no country behind. There were also notable improvements uh, uh, or movements on this in the new greenhouse gas strategy. A just and equitable transition was entirely absent from the previous iteration of the strategy. It also makes, and this is so key, a clear link between development measures and a just transition itself. We have to quite understand that whenever you're working with all, with what we're working with when we're looking for, uh, especially at uh, lower developing countries, least developing countries, sorry, or SIDS, is that the maritime sector is so key for their economies that it's not about greening and just transitioning to a decarbonized maritime sector. That's great, that's the goal. But it's actually about looking at the economy and building that shipping sector whilst doing that same thing. So there is, that, that's the, the other part here, is that there needs to be a focus on SIDS, on LDC, so they can transition and how those impacts can be mitigated. And then it also suggests that how revenues from GHG pricing are delivered should not necessarily be evenly distributed between all countries. Perhaps a levy is something that I will mention later on, but you've covered it so well that I, I barely need to mention that. But there should be that investment to facilitate access to new opportunities. So we're always talking about, oh, okay, we're moving to a green economy. These are new opportunities for development for these countries. Okay, fine, where are they? Where are the investments for these opportunities? So this is all good news. But all of this good news will be entirely dependent on how the sector and countries react to the strategy itself. So how is industry going to react to national or international policy? Will they comply or will they act on policies made? I mean, the talks here at COP28, they're wonderful. We're hearing all about this good stuff, about the importance of these policies. It's, it's great that the, uh, the IMO has this new GHG strategy, but we need it to be implemented which brings on international investment. Again, great, finance, but the finance for the, these countries to access these great opportunities has to come from somewhere. Who's going to foot the bill? Where, okay, and, and actually, I'll move forward because I know I want to move to the panel and I'm gonna run out of time on this. Uh, on this. So a just and equitable transition requires 
requires a people-centered, human rights-based approach. As someone who's been working with climate justice for over a decade, a decade now in these various spaces, it can seem really tired sometimes to see all this talk of justice. Where is the action required? We've been talking about environmental justice, then climate justice, and now we're in a just transition. Okay, these are all really important, but the reason we keep renaming it or moving it to the different sectors is because justice has simply not been done. So, and I know I don't have to go into telling the room that there are global inequities in this world that, that, we can, that we know of, but the shipping industry is fundamental to the global economy. The shipping industry is not only a driver of the globalized economy itself, but transports 80% of global trade. And all countries over the world rely on it to deliver essential goods, foods, energies, but the sector also burns 300 million tons of fossil fuels per year. That's one billion tons of CO2 emissions. So the sector needs whole scale transition to new scalable zero emission fuels and technologies. And there are three key elements we need to understand to ensure that this isn't an unjust transition. First is historically unequal contributions to the climate crisis. A lot of these countries, the non-industrialized countries, they're not historically responsible for the state of the world. Again, how many times have we heard this over the, over the how many cops we've been to now? This concept of common but differentiated responsibilities started 30 years ago, right? But we're still here. So there's a certain, for example, when it comes to African countries, which is a lot of countries I work with, a moral legitimacy that they can bring into the negotiations, meaning that they, they don't have emissions almost any emissions to cut, they can't finance other projects, so where are we? They can bring in the need to, to, uh, to do something, to act on it. And something that the late Dr. Hugh Seeley, who probably many of you in this room know, yes, yes, from Barbados, I was on a panel with him, that's like six months before he died, sorry, yes, uh, yeah, and, uh, and on security, and he made it really clear, it was really touching how he just said, uh, the islands, are the consciousness of these negotiations. He made it really adamant that he's like, you know what it's like when you're standing in front of someone negotiator and you know, you're looking them in the eye and you know that they don't care if you survive. They just care about their economy. He's like, that's what it's like. And that's the reality for a lot of these states in these negotiations. So there's, there are lots of things to do and lots of things to move forward. Um, and I think I've moved a, far, uh, a little bit too far ahead. But anyway, good, because I'm running out of time. Anyway, okay, so we have that. Uh, so, okay, let's move here. So what can we, can we do to ensure a just transition? So as after you said these very words, it needs to be procedurally fair and environmentally effective. So that means it needs to be socially just. This includes all of, the, all of these aspects. It includes gender, it includes community, it includes all of these things. And that includes seafarers like Mao, who you're going to hear from later, uh, and, and port workers, and everyone along, this, along the value chains of this, of, these, of this. It needs to be globally equitable. Existing dis disparities that already exist, if, if measures aren't put in place, will be exacerbated. It's just going to get worse. Uh, there are lots of measures that we can do. I've I gotten last, the last one. Uh, the polluter pays levy that the Solomon Islands and the Marshall Islands have put forward at MEPC 76. Yeah, uh, that's, that is a way that we can uh, look at how the distribution of equitable funds can be used in a, in a just transition. And then finally, it needs to be technologically inclusive. Sharing technology, you know, I hate to keep saying this, but we keep hearing this. African countries have been asking for these technologies to fight climate change forever. And this is this still needs to be done. But in the shipping industry, we do have this opportunity now. We're developing lots of new, green, exciting, innovative uh, actions on the continent of Africa, in the island states themselves. A collaborative effort needs to be done here. Um, so I'm out of time. I know I'm out of time. Um, there's lots of work that we, get, that we do at UCL. Please do come up to us afterwards, and I'll happily speak to a lot of the work that we are doing in African countries, in the Caribbean, uh, or trying to start in the Caribbean. I, I know who's in the room here. Uh, and also with the Pacific Island states. But I'll leave it with that. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. And.
If I could invite our moderator up here, Jean-Yves Remy is our wonderful moderator for our panel session. So Jean-Yves, if you want to, no, thank you. Do you want to? Oh, make, do I stand? Uh, no, 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 no. You gotta have a seat. You have a you have a microphone for you there. And. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So what I'm gonna do is ask my esteemed panelists to please join me on the podium. I will call each of you out, but please, all of you make your way. Um, I think we are gonna ask Ambassador. Will you be able to join us on the panel? So I'm gonna ask Ambassador Ishoro to join us, and he's already been introduced. Um, he's the Special Presidential Envoy for Decarbonization of Shipping um, in the Marshall Islands. I will also ask Mr. James Minupi, the Advisor of Hydrogen and Hydrogen Commissioner in Namibia, I will also ask Mr. Mao, Ma, now if I'm butchering your names, I'm so sorry. Uh, Mr. Mao Tse Biotas, um, and he is the uh, Amosup Youth Representative at, at the Siemens Training Center in the Philippines. And I will ask Meg Gentle, who is the Executive Director of HIF Global. And last but no, by no means least, Ms. Raquel Moses, the CEO of Caribbean Climate Smart Accelerators. So welcome. We have a really full, I know, extremely representative panel here. And in fact, instead of you know regaling everyone with your wonderful accolades, what I'll do, and this is a lightning round, I will ask each of you in no more than a minute, just equitable transition from your esteemed and expert perspective. What does that translate into? And folks, based on how they answer that question, I'm sure you'll know from which part of this discussion they emanate. So whether it's business, workers, um, energy transition, um, diplomatic, Etc. So I'm gonna literally go this way, ladies first. Please, Raquel, you go first. No, pro no problem, and thank you so much, and really nice to, to see all of you. So from our perspective, it is about the energy transition, right? And we have over 25 gigawatts of new renewables that our region in the Caribbean can produce, and we can use that because it's more than we need to serve our internal demand for energy. So we would need to convert the rest of that, even to explore all of it, into something that we can use and introduce green hydrogen. It's an opportunity for us. But even the way that that new market is being ruled out, it is not being ruled out in a just and equitable fashion. They created the, um, oh gosh, the clean energy marine hubs. And outside of Panama, there are no either Global South or, well, there are some Global South because Brazil's on it, but Br Brazil is huge. There are no SIDS on it. And so we don't get into the right rooms that will allow us to mm -hmm. participate in the new economy. Mm -hmm. So then we end up having the same situation that we have now where we didn't contribute to this problem, but somehow we're being excluded from the economy that is being created to solve it. Mm -hmm. And that is the perpetuating the problem that we're in. Wonderful way to open. You are here, you are in the room now, Caribbean Sid. So really happy to have you. Please, um, it's Meg. Yeah. Meg Gentle. Thank you. Blue, um, uh, just an equitable shipping. Uh, yes, I'm with a company called HIF Global and we produce e-fuels. E-fuels are synthetic fuels that are made from green hydrogen and recycled CO2. And so uh, what we are trying to do, two main things on just an equitable transition. One is we are making fuels that can be used by existing infrastructure. So they don't have to go into new things that can only be afforded by certain countries. Um, they can be used everywhere in the world by existing infrastructure. And then second, we're trying to build projects, and we have a producing project in southern Chile today. 
um, where um, the projects can take renewable resources that don't have population that can consume the electricity and then transform them into liquids that can be sold on a worldwide basis and could even be sold on a dollar denominated basis, which helps for financing and capital raising in uh, some of the lower income countries in the world. Excellent. So this is obviously business. <laughs> business representative, but business thinking really concretely about the needs of the developing world. Mao. Thank you. So from the last session that I have participated, just transition is considered as a wicked problem because it is hard to define and it comes with complex solutions. So generally speaking, if yeah, the general definition for that is moving together at the same space, considering all the perspective from all stakeholders. But for us, the seafarers, we are the primary unit of workforce. And for us, just transition is more on an emotional level. So just transition for us seafarers is lying comfortably in our bed, in the cabin, not thinking about the new equipment being installed, how to operate that new equipment. Just transition is having to spend time with our loved ones, not being bombarded by countless number of trainings. Just transition is less stress on board because of increased documentation brought about by that. And just transition, finally, is not feeling insecure of the future, that the employability is at stake because of the digitalization and decarbonization. Thank you. That's real, Mao. Thank you for that. And I know because we do a little research into the background that this idea of just transition really started in the context of workers and workers' rights. And now it seems to be bandied around in a lot of different contexts. So thanks for bringing it back to brass tacks. This is what it means to you. This is what it means to the worker is to be comfortable in the environment and the sector we're moving into. Perfect. Over to you now about, I know, I know you're the Namibian um, advisor on hydrogen. Now, everybody's talking about this green hydrogen. You have a task. What is just an equitable transition from your perspective in the hydrogen sector? Um, it sounds a lot like what Raquel was saying, right? It is, it requires an idiosyncratic, asymmetric, bespoke, and deliberate deployment of fiscal resources to give lower middle income countries seeds, countries without a lot of resources to write subsidies to house projects like HIF Global, an opportunity to valorize the God-given renewable energy potential that we have so that we can provide affordable, ready to drop fuels in his ship so that he doesn't have to worry about weird conversions and people then kicking him out of a job but the honest truth, just as Raquel said, it then gives us an opportunity to actually not just participate in this new economy, but to contribute to the problem that is affecting us uniquely badly, right? Like if you look at developed nations, they're much better placed to deal with climate change. You know, they have the money to build whatever infrastructure they need. When a country like Namibia gets hit by a drought or wildfires that burnt enough land the size of whales in our country, we don't have the helicopters to go and deal with that fire. Um, we had to spend 800 million Namibian dollars just now to deal with the drought. So what Raquel is talking about, we are seeing is when the U.S. writes the IRA, which essentially creates subsidies for HIF to build a project in Arizona and not Luderitz, they are using oil money, they are the largest producer of oil today, to underwrite the production of clean synthetic fuels in their country. So they're, and by the way, they're exploring for new oil today in Alaska. So they keep on pumping the oil, they're exploring for new oil, and then they use those dollars to capture the renewable sector. And people like Raquel and I then get left being told, A, don't pump it, right? Don't produce new oil because it doesn't have a business case. But when we try and ask HIF to come and develop, she says, well, Texas is giving me three bucks a kilo on the production cost of green hydrogen. Sorry, I can't come to Namibia. And by the way, Namibia has no infrastructure. So you're a desert, Texas, Saudi, Australia, Chile have existing infrastructure. 
So the money just goes back into developed nations already. And that's not very just. So when I talk about this idiosyncratic bespoke um, deployment of resources, when EU puts together a CBAM, when you put together your $150 worth of, of carbon tax, when you raise that money, don't use that money to put it in the EU Innovation Fund so that the Europeans become more effective at capture. Redistribute that to people like Raquel and myself and give us an opportunity to build infrastructure that we don't have. If you do not do that, you will create a dystopian Earth where A, you're not going to decarbonize Africa. Guess what? We're polluting and we're growing anyway, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the world is going to burn. And then B, you're going to create a lot of inequity, anger, conflict, and we all don't want to live in that sort of planet. So that's what it means. Yeah. Thanks. Well, this is the... Thank you, James. This, is the, this was supposed to be the lightning round. I feel as if you've given us the answers. Um, I will allow you to respond maybe when I ask your, the bespoke question. But if it's going to be 20 seconds, yes, you, you, can, you can say something that's targeted. We'll talk more during the bespoke question, but where we are in Chile, there's absolutely no infrastructure, and we that is where we started, and we also have projects in Uruguay and Australia, and today I was meeting uh, with one of your teams in Namibia looking at the algae um, CO2 uh, to uh, uh, e-fuels project, so we're very excited to look in all the places. Excellent. And and I'm from the Caribbean. I Raquel is from the Caribbean. Namibia still seems really big to us, right? Sure. I mean, we're talking about, in, in the case of St. Lucia, 170,000 people. So I, I guess the, the question and the problem is so local. And it's so, um, um, uh, what's, the, what's the word? It's so rel relative. Right, but we'll get into a little bit of that because I want to hear from each of you about um, what you're bringing and your company or your organization is bringing. Ambassador, um, we heard your view on the just transition, so I'm going to actually use the opportunity to pivot to the the more specific question. Um, and Curleen gave me some great ideas, but I'm actually going to twist it a little bit about the question I want to ask you. So I know the Marshall Islands have really been leading the charge at the IMO. And I know some of the other SIDS may not be as represented in these negotiations and in these discussions. So the question I have for you is, can you touch on what very concrete ways that the Marshall Islands is driving the agenda at the IMO, and how can we get more SIDS and more LDCs to join you in your task? Thank you. A very, very good question. Um, so uh, let, me, let me try and address the first part um, first. Uh, the Marshall Islands is, uh, we have a unique position in IMO. We're not only a member, but we're the third largest registry in the world behind Panama and um, Liberia. So that gives us a unique voice. Um, we could have said, well, we don't want to talk about this because we want revenue. But we wanted to talk about it because we felt that it needed the attention uh, required to transition uh, that specific sector. The Marshall Islands has been leading this with uh, other Pacific countries. And most recently, I'm very proud to add that uh, His Excellency Ambassador Fuller has been uh, one of our key partners from um, the Caribbeans. And hopefully, as we continue these negotiations, um, more will join us. Uh, the, the issue within IMO is because it's such a technical organization. Um, I mean, when you go to IMO versus when you come here, uh, to me, this is such a huge, overwhelming circus. Um, <laughs> pun intended. In IMO, it's more precision because it's so technical. A lot of the conversation, a lot of the discussions are really on a practical level. Um, Marshall Islands has also been creating opportunities where we're looking at new technologies in terms of vessels. Because vessels is very important. It's how we connect our remotest communities. But it costs us hundreds of thousands of dollars to send one vessel around the islands. So how do we reduce that? So currently, we just launched a, 
um, a vessel in South Korea where I'm based, um, which is going to help reduce our dependency on uh, fossil fuel by 80 percent because it's both using wind and solar powers. Uh, so we're not just saying do it, but we're also demonstrating that it can be done. Thank you so much for these um, remarks. And yes, I did mean to say that Ambassador Fuller is negotiating on our behalf. Um, he's Belizean and he can't make it. So thank you so much for joining the panel. So that's a really interesting perspective. I'm gonna come back to you, um, Raquel. And I know we only have about 20 minutes, so um, we're gonna have to get a, a slightly quick, uh, a quick round than we initially intended. But Raquel, you work with Accelerate, the climate accelerator for the Caribbean. And one of the things that I think is so important are the partnerships and collaborations that we need to forge between the public, private, multilateral institutions to drive the adoption of these cleaner technologies. And thinking even just about the finance and the investment, how do you um, accelerate using your hubs, using your labs. What are the best practices for bringing all these disparate entities together to drive the new greener fuels that we need in the Caribbean? That's an excellent question. And I want to start. Thank you so much, my good friend James. Listen, you're preaching to the choir. I just wanted to jump up and say hallelujah. Because that's exactly that is that is the that is the story, right? You know, we are working really hard on bringing the region together, on collaborating between public and private sector. What we, the vision that we have for our region is to connect the entire region via undersea cable for the production and export of green hydrogen. But your point is valid, and I'll tell you a story, a quick, quick story about the IRA. We have a vision of uh, manufacturing solar panels. The in Inflation Reduction Act in the U.S., which is, you know, providing subsidies to U.S. companies for the development of their, of their uh, renewable, yeah. renewable energy resources. So we had this vision for our region to manufacture solar panels. And what we thought we would start with is assembling these panels. So we found a private sector company that wanted to invest. The government prepared the project, and we were ready to go. And what we needed was a developer with experience in manufacturing solar to come to the table. We found one. We were in negotiation. And then the IRA, IRA, IRA hit. And they were like, oh, we would love to come do this in your country, but you're going to have to wait till 2027 because the demand in the US is so huge. And I appreciate that the IRA was done for all of the right reasons, but it's a vacuum that's sucking out the potential of our ability to develop. And I'll tell you one more. While I don't even think that we need the subsidies, eh? what we need are the offtake agreements, because the offtake agreements will allow us to use our own liquidity, our own banks to fund the agreements, but we are not getting the offtake agreements. And even the consortiums to come up with the offtake agreements are being organized outside of our reach. And so we are being continuously pushed out of the middle and not able to access this market. And I love what you're doing, but even still in the development of those projects, what is likely to happen is that the profit from those projects are extracted. And what we have to do in this just and equitable transition is look at the models that we have used that have got us to where we are and find a new model because we will continue to repeat the sins that have gotten us in this situation. Preach, sister, right? Absolutely. So, Meg, I had a question for you that was prepared to kind of come up with innovative strategies or tell us about your innovative business practice. I, I feel like in the first round you explained what these are. Respond to Raquel. Well, I, <laughs> tell us I, how we redo business. Tell us how your business can be redone so that it's, you know, you meet your end of year targets, but you're also doing the right thing by developing countries as well. I think it's perfect that um, Raquel was addressing um, offtake agreements because we have the same challenge. We, we have to have long-term offtake agreements, 15 to 20 years, that will support the financing. And, and that's true wherever the project is. Um, and for fuel markets, 
um, that is not a time period that people are accustomed to contracting for their fuel. People buy shipping fuel either on a cargo by cargo basis or maybe on a month basis or maybe on a year basis, not a 20 year basis. So um, we've been working on some mechanisms to try to overcome this. And we can use the example of the aviation market where regulation is coming through um, requiring um, these decarbonized fuels. And this sends a clear, um, stable you know, demand message that then enables companies um, to contract on this long-term basis. And, and so we're, one of the main things we're doing here um, at COP this year is trying to work on the shipping side with how can we use the example of aviation to create some of these clear demand signals so that we can have the long-term contracts. Um, and, and maybe one more story I'll tell, and this is another example. Um, so one thing that we're doing on our next expansion in Chile is that a portion of it will be exported and a portion of it will be used in Chile. Um, and, and that's for the, um, that won't be shipping fuel, it will be gasoline, but the fuel distributor there um, and NAP will purchase some um, of the, the gasoline and distribute the cost of the green fuel over all of the gasoline that they distribute in Chile. So it's only, you know, a one or two cent increase in the cost of the gasoline, you know, for everyone. And then the actual greenness, you know, uh, stays there in the region where the project is. And it's benefited from the other half, which it can go for the export market that supports that long-term financing. So that that's another example of how we can keep these uh, green fuels in the country where, where they're produced um, and still put together the financial underpinning that has to be there for a $7 billion project to go forward. Thank you so much, Megan. And as, I, as you're saying that, what occurs to me is how important it is for uh, Exim banks and development agencies in the first world, in the developed countries, to work and provide the financing to companies like yours so that you can invest outside. Because we often think about the work happening you know, alone by the private sector coming in, but there are ways that governments and development banks can incentivize and assist companies like yours, private companies, so that they can underwrite some of their costs and go into the developing world. Thanks for that. Um, I'm putting you on notice, James, that we're talking a lot about the technology here, about, oh no, you're after, um, you're gonna come after Ma, but I'm putting you on notice and I'm gonna ask you a little bit just to deconstruct for us what we mean by hydrogen, green hydrogen, and all of these things. Like, what is in the engineering and in the science behind it? But before we go to you, Mao, um, so you are dreaming about this world where you don't have to worry about the future of seafarers and the people you represent. But I wonder, in today's world, what are the sorts of training? What are the sorts of activities and formative uh, sort of... Um, opportunities that your sector is is actually preparing um, the workforce for that you think is going to be absolutely key for taking advantage of, of and thriving in the green energy shipping sector. Yeah, it's quite amazing on the developments that was shared with my fellow panelists here. But at the end, at the end of the day, we the seafarers will execute at the most fundamental level. So all of those happening at the top will trickle down to us at the bottom, right? So now, don't get me wrong, let's be clear. We seafarers are inherently all in for the green transport and decarbonization. After all, who wouldn't want that, right? So what we're like requesting or asking is just to enforce us or to give us the tools to properly and effectively execute those movements towards green transportation. So. For our younger generations, especially us, seafarers. So it was a story. So one of the senior officers like, gave a command to a junior officer, which is a friend of mine, to just dispose waste to the sea. And to show you a story of how we young generations are very much involved now in protecting the environment, my friend actually debated with a senior officer, no, no, that's not right. 
and that resulted to my friend being deported back to the Philippines. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a true story. So, wow. and in lieu of that, so there are different challenges that we are facing before I go into the interventions. First and foremost is that it introduced increased workload for us seafarers. So all the new regulations that comes with new documentations. And with new documentations and regulations, there comes new trainings. And with new trainings means less family time. So we seafarers in our life cycle, we have 12 months in a year, right? In that one year, we spend like, in average, nine months on board sea. Three months with our family. With the increased regulation and increased training, out of the three months, we only spend time with our family for about two weeks, three weeks, and going on board for another nine months. So we were joking like, all of, most of our life, three-fourths of our life is usually spent on board ships. So, and all of that, it contributes to the increased risk, risk of accidents and pollution because there is a inadequate capacity, capacity building initiatives. So to solve all of that is that you have to go to the root cause, which is the obsolete education framework. So the STCW right now is like focused on the psychomotor skills. Based on the studies and all the sessions that we have, the psychomotor skills in the 21st century and going into the 2050 will be obsolete and we should focus on the critical thinking skills and soft skills. So we have to have a major overhaul of the education because supplementing training is not inadequate with this fast-paced uh, decarbonization and digitalization. And most of all, uh, this is my tagline here, this is just transition with the heart. So we have to increase capacity building, right? More trainings. But we have also to consider that the time allocation, we have to give enough time for the seafarers to spend with their families. So it's okay for us to train, it's no problem for us as long as we are also given uh, in ad uh, ad adequate time for us to spend with our loved ones. So that's it. Well, thank, thank you, you so much for that reminder that at the, end, at the end of the day, it's communities, it's people, it's workers, it's, you know, communities, really. Um, we only, unfortunately, I'm being told, have five more minutes. I hate to squeeze you, James. I will ask you, Ambassador, just to close us off, maybe one minute. But James, to you, like, tell us what we're talking about at the end. Like, tell uh, us what's coming. Uh, what's I'll, coming? I'll tell you about the science and what's coming. But you have to know there's nothing wrong with the science. Hydrogen is, is merely an extremely important ingredient in decarbonizing industry, but it, you know, shipping, in building the fuel that he needs to travel safely on this, on this ocean without emitting carbon, right? So we will take renewable energy, we'll split water, we'll take the hydrogen. After that, you can do stuff with it. You can combine it with nitrogen, which can be used in ships, by the way, uh, when you make ammonia. The formula for methanol, which is the other thing the ships we use, is CH3OH. So you need the carbon and you need the hydrogen. Those are the key components. That's the science. There's nothing wrong with the science. It's fairly simple. You can Google it. I'll come back to Raquel's point. Because without Raquel's point, there is no science that's going to save the rest of us that don't have the money. Meg is a good person. Okay? So let's get that right. So Meg is saying we need quotas. Yeah? <laughs> quota for shipping fuel and e-kerosene, which is jet fuel, right? And if we create demand, legislative demand and quota, she ha finds it easier to sell her product. She can, she can bank her project. She can raise money from banks. What Raquel and I are saying is, you have to be discriminatory in how you avail the quotas. If you just say to the world, I need X million tons of ammonia, you will get 27 projects from the developed world providing your ammonia. And you will not solve this problem of inequity, right? I just came from talking to Siemens. Siemens Energy is a fantastic OEM. They say to me, I'm going to build my fourth, in fact, my fifth project in France, mm -hmm. yeah? To produce the same hydrogen that the EU needs. They would super struggle to build their first project in Namibia. The US and the EU, as, by the way, I'm working very close with them, so I'm not bashing them. I'm just trying to say to them, it's we okay. need to think, right? So, Tell us like it so is. So they're putting together H2 Global, right? Which is a competitive double-sided auction that creates demand. But they're basically taking money from the Europeans to find project from the Europeans to create the molecules right there, right? So we need a bespoke 
offtake vehicle for molecules made in specific regions, such as Africa, for example, right, that are targeting offtake from these regions yeah. that need the development, right? So it is to say, hey, I'm raising all this money with C-bombs, all this money with taxes, yeah. or any other money. This 100 billion they promised us. Don't give me the money. Yeah. Give me this offtake. Yes. Say that I will set aside a 2010 eight billion dollar program that will offtake the molecules from seeds from Namibia because I can tell you exactly what Raquel said is happening in Namibia. The guys wanted to come and build an electrolyzer um, manufacturing facility, solar, and they all went to Arizona, they all went to Spain, they all yeah. went to Italy, right? So that is at the core of a just energy transition? Absol no, absolutely. I couldn't have said it. I feel like you're, we need to have a discussion when this ends. <laughs> Ambassador, we literally have um, four minutes. Carolina is saying, is there one question from the floor or comment? I'll ask Ambassador to close it off and then we'll continue talking after, unless there's a 10 second soundbite any of my panelists would like to make. But first of all, any questions or comments from the floor? I feel that. Such a rich discussion, you may want to join in. No? No? Trevor, please. Uh, I had a question. Sorry. Sure. Just, just very quickly about the, um, the, the levy. Uh, I, I wonder uh, about how you would offset the, the potential impacts on countries that are off main trading routes and therefore tend to be less developed. They would now, the ships traveling there would be subject to a higher levy. Um, uh, and might actually discourage sort of uh, 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 lead to an inequitable access to sort of global maritime corridors. Is there a way of dealing with that? Yeah, we looked at, thanks Trevor, and Trevor and I are working on a project to remake trade so that it's more just and equitable. Great question. I mean, we looked at some parts of the just and equitable transition. Um, Ambassador, I think you're great to answer and to close us off with that question of the incidence of this levy. How do we make sure it doesn't further alienate those off location, off the main grid locations like ours? Location like the Pacific. <laughs> exactly. We've, we've gone through this conversation within ourselves and with other SIDS. Um, obviously, we're the most disproportionate impact. This is one of the important reasons why a compre comprehensive impact assessment is now being debated on the levy to see the level of disproportionate negative impact that this levy will put onto um, those m most impacted right now. Um, uh, uh, by the current situation uh, in global trade. Um, but the fact is, um, um, you know, we, we, th there needs to be some, some elements of understanding. You know, a levy needs to help buffer some of these costs that will, will rise. When we did our own studies in the Pacific, we recognized that there will be an increase, but it's not an increase that will cost your arm. So it's, it's an increase that even now, with the fluctuating oil price, we, we, we absorb. Um, so I'll, I'll, just, I'll just say that, and we can have further conversation around that after this. But just to close off, this is why we are fighting so hard for a levy. Because two parts of that levy that I, I discussed quite generally there, one is for the inter, uh, internal transition of the sector. What that means is new ships, new fuels. I honestly believe that the Global South is the region that will unlock the potential of renewable energy. It's at the Global South. If you're talking hydrogen, if you're talking uh, solar, if you're talking about other new renewable emerging technologies, it's there at the Global South. And this is the opportunity that, you know, I, I hear what's happening. And this is why uh, $100 billion right now equals to $80 billion in new financing a year. And that means that half of that, or slightly under half of that in our proposal, goes to the in-sector transition. But the other 51% comes to the vulnerable countries so that they can continue to build resilience or build the necessary um, industries that can put them 
on an even playing field yeah. with the others that have the financing and, and the capital. So Thank that is that is an important point. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for bringing it back and closing us off. We either need to redistribute the resources at the end through the levy or to create the opportunities in situ, in the countries at the start of the process. And I think we got these wonderful, wonderful perspectives from this panel, from business to people on the ground, to workers, to small economies, to larger economies, to investors, um, to commissioners. I, I think Please join me in thanking this esteemed panel for the wonderful perspective. Thank you all. Uh, please, please let us continue the conversation. And let me thank the hosts. I'm going to turn over to Colleen. Thanks the hosts for putting on such a wonderful panel. Thank you all. Thank you all. Just to say thank you all for coming. And um, our panelists are here if you have further questions. So please. <laughs>